It's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video, I'm going to be taking a look at the OSD on screen display menu system of the AOC Q27G3XMN. The OSD is controlled by pressable buttons on the underside of the bottom bezel towards the right side. There are some little engraved button labels, but they're very difficult to see in most lighting. So you basically got a source select, a left arrow, a right arrow, the main menu, and a power button. There's also a little power LED, a power indicator there. So when you're not in the main menu system, press the first button, you can cycle the inputs used by the monitor, and you can then press the fourth button, which is the menu button, to select one of those. The second button, which is the left arrow, if you press that on its own, you can cycle through the game modes, and I'll go through that when I get to them in the main menu system. The third button, that puts a crosshair on the screen. So there's what appears to be white, it then cycles to red or off. So the red one is always red, Whereas there was one that was white before, it's displaying as black, it's difficult to see because of that wallpaper, but yeah, it's black again. So it changes colour depending on the content to try and contrast with the background. So you see it's gone green now, for example. So if you press that third button again, it'll disappear. So if you've got that crosshair on the screen, and I had this quite a bit when I was reviewing the monitor and you don't actually want it to be there, it's because you press the third button. So you just have to press that a few times until it disappears. In terms of control of the main menu system, the fourth button along, which is your menu button, that counts as enter. The first button, which is source select when you're not in the main menu, that counts as back. And then there's the left and the right arrows, which allow you to go left or right or up and down in the menu. So if I wanted to go to color setup, I just press the left arrow to get there from where I was before, picture boost. I then press the fourth button as enter. And the second button, the left arrow will be up and the third button, right arrow, will be down. I can then go deeper into the menu by pressing that fourth button, enter. Or if I want to go back, I press that first button, the source select button. So it does take a bit of getting used to. It's a bit awkward, especially compared to using a joystick. I'm quite used to this. I've used a lot of AOC monitors before, but even then I do find it more intuitive having a joystick or a directional control instead of this. So before going through the main menu, I want to address the question. What are the best settings for this monitor? And by best settings, I mean the settings which I use during the review. They satisfy my colorimeter targets. They work on my unit and according to my own preferences. So this is gonna vary between units and individual preferences. These are just a suggestion. So the first thing to focus on is the preset. They're under game settings. You've got game mode. I'd recommend leaving this off because that gives you the maximum flexibility. FPS, for example, well, by default, that's quite bright. It appears to apply a sharpness filter, which you can't actually control as well. It also blocks off quite a few settings, such as shadow control, the game color setting, overdrive, you can't even just overdrive, it's locked at weak, which is odd. And the whole of the color setup menu and picture boost is also grayed out. So it's just very restrictive. And you don't get an improvement to input lag just because you're using game mode, by the way. So I don't think that there's any particular reason in that respect to use a game mode. RTS makes different adjustments and has similar settings locked off. Same with racing, different adjustments again, lots of restrictions. Gamer 1, it's less restrictive, although the color setup menu and picture boost is still disabled. And there's Gamer 2, makes different adjustments and locks off your color setup as well. And Gamer 3, more of the same. So yep, definitely would just recommend leaving this off for the best balance to the image and also the ability to actually adjust everything you might want to adjust. I also made some adjustments in color setup. So I changed the color temp from the default of warm to user, which allows you to adjust the color channels. And I changed red to 46, green to 50, blue to 50. But these just worked on my units and according to my colorimeter achieved a well-balanced 6,500K white point with good neutral green channel. Again, this is gonna vary between individual units. The other thing I changed was brightness. I reduced that to 25, which got to my usual target of around 160 nits. AMD FreeSync, that's your adaptive sync toggle, so you'd need to have that set to on if you want to use NVIDIA G-Sync compatible mode, as well as AMD FreeSync. And when you do that, low input lag is actually greyed out, but it's set to on and it does have low input lag. I recorded a nice low input lag with AMD FreeSync set to on. So if you don't want to use VRR, you can have that set to off, then just make sure low input lag is also set to on. There's no disadvantage to having this set to on versus off. You might as well just leave it on. As I've said, with AMD FreeSync enabled in the OSD, you can expect low input lag either way, and you can't access or change the low input lag setting. It's basically just set to on automatically. 
So as a reminder, game mode set to off, brightness is set to 25. I've made some changes to the color channels. AMD FreeSync is enabled. Overdrive, I like to set to medium. That's just my preference, but I explore this in detail in the review. I can see a reason that you might want to use strong and depending on the refresh rate, perhaps even weak. So there are just a couple of other settings to be aware of that you may want to use or change depending on your own preferences and the particular model you have. I say that because there's a color gamut setting it's set to panel native, which will use the full native gamut, but there's also sRGB and DCI-P3. Now on my unit, they do absolutely nothing. So yes, it looks different on panel native, but the only reason for that is that I've made my own adjustments elsewhere. But by default, if you've got everything set to the same color temp mode and everything else set up the same, then on the BK model, this appears to do absolutely nothing, this particular color gamut toggle. So just leave it on panel native. On the non-BK model, which is sold in the US, for example, then it does actually have an sRGB emulation setting. So if you want to use sRGB emulation for a more toned down look, more appropriate within the sRGB color space, then you can set this to sRGB. Just be aware that if you do that, you can't access the color channels, you can adjust the brightness, you can't adjust the contrast or the gamma mode. Speaking of the gamma mode, that is something which I left on gamma one, which worked on my unit. Gamma two is lower. So gamma one on mine it averaged 2.3, Gamma 2, that averaged 2.1, I believe. Gamma 3 was higher, I think it was 2.5 or 2.6 or something like that. So if you want a deeper look to things, try Gamma 3. If you want to raise details, for example, have a bit more visibility in darker areas, perhaps try Gamma 1, all according to your own preferences. But Gamma 1 was most accurate, most appropriate on my unit. There's also a local dimming setting. I set that to off when I'm on the desktop. As I explore in the review though, it does have its uses when you're viewing dynamic content such as games and movies. And I'd recommend setting this to strong if you want to be using it. The other adjustments I make still apply when you're using local dimming, except for the brightness. So at 25, things are going to look generally dim. They're going to be dragged down a lot. So you probably want to increase this. So if you wanted to use a brightness of 25, you might want to increase this to 50, or actually my preference was 60, just in general. This will make some things quite a bit brighter than with the setting disabled and set to 25 also will make some things nice and deep. It gives you a good contrasty look without being too extreme. Again, this is all explored in the review. Looking in now on HDR, there's an HDR mode setting. This is actually an HDR emulation mode if you're using the monitor in SDR. So you've got an SDR signal. It's not actually being fed an HDR signal, the monitor. It applies a weird sharpness filter. It oversaturates things. It upsets the balance. If you happen to like how things look, then feel free to use this. Game has the weakest sort of effect in terms of the extra saturation. Movie's a bit stronger and Vivid stronger again. So depending on the level of oversaturation you want, then you could use this. You can actually see it quite clearly with this desktop wallpaper that your shade variety is affected when you're using this. Things sort of get crushed together. That's because it's not expanding the gamut itself. It's just pulling shades closer to the edge of the gamut. If you feed the monitor an HDR signal, so I've now enabled HDR in Windows, you'll see quite a bit of the menu is greyed out. And the local dimming setting is set independently for SDR and HDR. So it remembers that I like this set to strong under HDR. And if you're using local dimming under HDR, you don't have control of brightness. I would absolutely recommend using local dimming and I would recommend setting it to strong as I cover in the review under HDR. There's also an HDR setting. Display HDR, HDR game, HDR movie, HDR vivid. I'm just going to quickly fire up a game under HDR to talk a little bit about these settings. So I would definitely recommend sticking to display HDR. The other settings, the first of all, it's like under SDR. They all have a sharpness filter. They also oversaturate with movie having a bit of a stronger effect in that respect and vivid a stronger effect again. So even if you're using HDR game, there's some oversaturation, but the sharpness filter I find pretty ugly and unnecessary. Things really do look over sharpened and you don't have any control of that. Either way, my recommendation is setting this to display HDR, which will give you the best balance, the most appropriate and intended look. I can also give you a super quick demonstration of the local dimming settings. Again, I said recommend strong. That's because it's the most dynamic. It will give you the best edge in contrast. So I'll explore the review in more detail. With it set to off, you can adjust the brightness, but things look really dim and odd unless you increase this significantly. And if you have this increased significantly, the backlight is just used as one unit. So the dark areas can't be dimmed. The contrast just isn't there. Again, all explored in the review. 
the contrast isn't anywhere near as strong as it should be or could be with the mini LED solution used, I should say. Set to low, that uses the mini LED solution, but it's less dynamic than medium and that's less dynamic than strong. So there's just an edge in contrast with strong, which means that the zones will be happy to dim down a bit more, for example, for some of the zones, whilst others will remain nice and bright. So it really just allows you to get the most out of the 336 dimming zone, so-called mini LED backlight solution. Let's look at the remaining settings in the menu now. So in game setting, game mode, which I've been through, the shadow control, I don't even need to open Legom, Legom.nl and the black levels test to show you this because even set one above to 60 completely floods the image. You massively reduce your contrast. Yes, it will give you better visibility in dark areas because it's lifting everything up, including dark shades and including black, which is why you lose the contrast. But the difference between 50 and 60 is huge, so it's not selective in any way in the adjustments it makes, so I don't like it. As I mentioned earlier, you might want to use Gamma 2 if you want a bit of an uplift in detail without such an effect on the image. And if you happen to want a sort of crushed together darker look to things, you can reduce shadow control below 50, and that will achieve that. There's Game Color. This is a saturation enhancement, which will pull shades closer to the edge of the gamut without enhancing or increasing the gamut itself. So you lose shade variety by increasing that, but things will look more vibrant. And this could be useful competitively, for example, if you just want to give a simpler look to things, so to speak. Sort of less going on visually, some people find. Could be helpful, perhaps, competitively. Or if you just prefer oversaturation. Or you can decrease this if you want to reduce saturation. Increase it completely, then things become completely monochrome or grayscale. I've been through AMD FreeSync Overdrive and Low Input Lag Frame Counter. This will display a little frame rate display or refresh rate display, which will be a frame rate display if you're using adaptive sync. And you can select right up if you want it at the top right, right down, left down, or left up. Just because of where the camera is, I'm going to have this right down so you can see it clearly. So you can see it's 180 in red there, 180 frames a second. Let's quickly open the G-Sync Pendulum demo and you'll be able to see that this is fluctuating as the frame rate of the content fluctuates. There's then volume, which allows you to control the volume of anything connected to the 3.5 millimeter jack of the monitor. This monitor does not include integrated speakers. You've got luminance, you've got usual contrast control, brightness, which I've been through, eco mode, and this will just set the brightness and the contrast to a predefined value. It will lock them off as well. The only exception here is, well, reading, which will make everything monochrome and doesn't lock the brightness off, and uniformity which is supposed to be kind of uniformity compensation mode. How well this works really depends on your own unit. It also locks off the brightness. I did actually test it a little bit on my unit and it didn't really significantly impact the uniformity. It sort of made a slight improvement, but nothing which I felt was really warranted much exploration in the review, to be completely honest. So it's there if you want to use it and it might work better on some units than others. And remember that this kind of setting will reduce your contrast because it's equalizing the brightness at different points of the screen, or that's what it intends to do. So it'll basically digitally dim a lot of the screen so it's as dim as the dimmest point, or that's in theory how it would work. So yes, it does eat away at contrast significantly. And as a VA panel, there are various gamma shifts, color shifts, and such like, which will occur just because of viewing angles, and that will also occur when you're viewing the edges of the screen compared to the center, which the uniformity setting cannot account for. This camera which I've been through, DCR, dynamic contrast ratio, that is a dynamic contrast setting which allows the entire backlight to shift as a single unit. Definitely wouldn't recommend using this, especially when you've got a good local dimming solution. If you happen to like how this works and how it looks, then feel free to use it. But as usual, it's a compromise because the entire backlight is shifting. And I find it tends to be quite bright for mixed content, including quite a bit of dark, such as this wallpaper. So it's really brightening up quite a bit. And you lose control of brightness, contrast, and gamma as well. HDR mode, which I've been through, local dimming, which I've been through. Color setup, so there's low blue mode. These are low blue light settings. There's multimedia, it's the weakest effect. Internet, a bit stronger. Office, stronger again. Reading, which is the strongest mode. So by this point, yes, it is an effective low blue light setting. It gives a warm look to the image, but it also gives this sort of yellowish green look to the image because it maintains a strong green channel. 
And I prefer the visual balance of low blue light settings when they give a kind of warm amber look to the image without the green push. I prefer it when they reduce the green channel. The advantage of having the green channel strong is that it maintains the strongest possible contrast because reducing the green channel would reduce the contrast. But anyway, what it's doing is it's massively reducing the blue channel, basically. And then that is effective in reducing blue light output. There are various other things you can do to achieve that. And actually just minimizing brightness of the monitor is important as well, whether you're using this setting or not. And you can indeed control the brightness when you're using this setting, so that's not a problem. It's just something which some people like to use for more relaxing viewing, particularly in the evening and the hours leading up to bed. Colour temp setting, kind of been through, I went through user anyway. The default of warm, it was actually slightly warm on my unit. Normal, which is actually cool, too cool, high white point. Cool, which is an even higher white point, very cool. And user, which allows you to manually configure the red, green and blue colour channels. Colour gamut setting, which I've been through, DCB mode, dynamic colour boost. So this is another one of those saturation enhancements. So full enhance will oversaturate everything. Nature skin focuses more on your red tones, green field more on oversaturating greens, sky blues on oversaturating the blues. Auto detect is supposed to look at the content and base its enhancements, its saturation boosts on that. So yeah, if you like any of these, feel free to use them, but you're going to be upsetting the balance and crushing shade variety, all of that good stuff, or not so good stuff. DCB demo, which gives you a split screen showing the kind of effect that DCB can have on versus not on. So the left shows it on, the right shows it off. Be wary of the split screen comparison because you might find the DCB looks nicer just because it's oversaturated, and you might find that normal looks a little bit I don't know, washed out in comparison, but actually normal is looking more accurate. Next up, you've got picture boost, and that allows you to control the bright frame setting. This allows you to change the digital brightness. This isn't the same as the main brightness control. It doesn't affect the backlight, the digital brightness control, and the contrast for a specific point of the screen. So you can change that frame size. You could actually have it filling the entire screen if you want. So it's in the top left by default. Although you can change the horizontal and vertical position of this little frame. But if you wanted, you know, huge fine control over the entire image, then you can set this to frame size 100, then make some little tweaks here. I know some people like to just tweak things like this. Personally, I don't. It does tend to upset the image in various ways. I don't want people to go against their own preferences. Listen to your own preferences if you like to use this kind of setting. Next is extra. This input select allows you to select the input used by the monitor off timer which will automatically turn the screen off after a given number of minutes sorry a given number of hours that must be between 1 and 24. There's an image ratio setting and actually this model isn't as fussy as some AOC monitors are so as long as the monitor's scaling I mean I haven't tested all resolution and refresh rate combinations but if the monitor's using its own scaling and you'll be able to see that if you go to extra it will tell you resolution if it doesn't match the native resolution of the display then it is using scaling on the monitor so you can see 1920 by 1080 and i've got it set to 120 hertz i can then access the image ratio settings however wide is the only option available i'll turn amd FreeSync off just in case yeah now you've got more things available 4x3 is grayed out so you probably need a 4x3 aspect ratio resolution to select that but there's one-to-one, -one, which is a pixel mapping feature, which will use only the pixels called for by the source resolution and give you black pixels for the rest of the screen. So there's no distortion. That's a perfect 1920 by 1080, just using much less of the screen. There's also simulation of a 17-inch 4x3 screen, 19-inch 4x3, 19-inch 5x4, 19-inch 16x10, 21.5-inch 16x9, 22 inch 16 by 10, 23 inch 16 by 9, 23.6 inch 16 by 9, 24 inch 16 by 9, and that was the last one. Now annoyingly it activates all of these and you can't cycle down to get to the top of the list, so if I want to get back to native I have to just cycle through all of these. To get back to wide. You've then got DDC slash CI, which allows you to use software to control the monitor. And there's Reset, which resets everything to the factory defaults. There's OSD Setup, you can change the language the OSD is displayed in, the timeout period, so how long after the last button press before the OSD will automatically collapse in on itself and disappear. Between 5 and 120 seconds. You can change the horizontal and vertical position of the OSD. 
You can adjust a transparency or transparency effect. And there's a break reminder feature, which after an hour will remind you to take a break. I'm just going to very quickly run through G menu. I've shown you this various times on other monitors, so I'm not going to go through everything. It's just to raise awareness of its software, which you can use to control some of the aspects of the monitor. So you can quickly change the game mode, for example. And if you press advance, you've got some other settings. You can't access everything you can access in the OSD. It's just a refined selection of settings, as you can see here. I'm not sure why overdrive can't be changed and gamma can't be changed. Perhaps that will change with later versions of this software, but for some reason it's restricting settings which should be available. So yeah, very cut down in terms of what you can change. There's Game Sync, and if you use that, you can select various different games or applications which will use different presets of the monitor if you want to do that. There's low blue mode. It's Obviously, it's available on this monitor, but not on the software at the moment for some reason. Eco mode, which is the same as it is in the OSD. It's display, allows you to change things like the resolution and refresh rate. It's the image ratio setting. Although this appears to be available, as I've shown you, there are certain conditions which will allow this to be used, and I'm not meeting those conditions because I'm running at the native resolution, and I've got FreeSync active in the OSD. You can also create hotkeys. So if you want to quickly change the brightness, then you can do that. You could do this in game as well. So if you want to be changing the brightness when you're in game, you have to first select hotkey on, then I could have control and control alt, sorry, and minus and control alt and plus or control alt and equals, same thing on my keyboard. And you don't have to have the application in the foreground. It just has to be running in the background and you could be on a game and you can use these hotkeys as well. Screen Plus, which is a separate utility you can download to help snap Windows to different positions, although Windows 11 has a very good integrated feature that allows you to do that as well. OLED Panel Care, that's for OLED monitors, which this monitor is not. Light Effects, which this monitor doesn't have. So that's really all of us to the OSD on-screen display menu system of the AOC Q27G3XMN. In the description of the video, you'll find some links to relevant content and also information about how you can support the work that we do. Be aware that liking the video, subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, they are nice ways of showing your support.